what's the energy you're bringing in today? Are the energy I'm bringing in today is, let's see, I would say, I would say the energy I'm bringing in today represents um, us being self-sufficient and, and reliant. 100%. And tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the idea of self-sufficiency is the rec recognizing your abilities. And a lot of times we're always looking for other people to tell us things about ourselves before we actually acknowledge them and actually bring them to the table to actually see them as possible. And I think now is a time where we are, what's going on in the world, I think it's time for us to really have that self-sufficient eye upon ourselves. It's to really recognize the abilities within ourselves without needing to hear it from someone else. But like, how do you wanna create yourself, right? And then how reliant are you to show up in that space without needing validation or someone to, you know, to tell you something, to make you feel whole, to be who you are. I think the whole idea of permission to shine is done. And it's now it's like shine on and you get to decide how bright and how beautiful and how luscious and how, how magnificent that look without someone saying like, you know what, your shine is too big for me. Well, then get your shine on because I'm doing my shine, do your shine. And so that shine is really relevant of the energy, the light, the, the intelligence, the, the, everything that you, you bring into the world as you. And, 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 and all of the beautiful arrays of colors and energies and spectrums that come from you should not be held back dependent upon someone being comfortable or not comfortable. And that's really what it comes down to. I think what's so interesting about that too is like our, our world right now, like the various matrices that are set up are not set up to like inspire us to trust ourselves. Yep. And so like what, I'm wondering, like, I guess so simply, like, how do we break out of that on a daily basis? So how have you been able to, in your daily practices, prayers, et cetera, like been able to really break out of that? Because we are like so much on our phones waiting for that, like that validation. So I'm just wondering like what that looks like. I, I would literally say it's a commitment to the social crazy in yourself, you know, because a lot of times when we think about crazy, we think about doing something that goes against the grain or being the black sheep or doing something that other people don't understand and that they might not like us or they might want to have us around and they might ostracize us. And I think there's a point where I was like, when I, when I look back, how lonely I was in school because everyone thought I was a freak. And then at one point it used to hurt me when people would call me a nerd or a freak or like just, you know, whatever they used to call me. Uh, because of the powers and the gifts that I have. And then I got to a point where I was just like, yeah, I am a freak. And I, and I <laughs> you know, and like, I love that. Like that yeah. feels really good. Like I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna turn that into a whole complete like world for myself and see like what that freakish world looks like and how much fun I can have in it with, and then let myself be so committed to it that I don't need to put signs that say, love me, accept me, come in, I'm safe. It's like, I'm just going to be me. You're going to want to come in because you're going to see how comfortable and how at ease and how peace and how, how rock and roll and what an amazing time I'm having with myself in my freakish world. And then you're just going to be like, can I get admittance to that freakish world, Sean and Derek? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> you a freak? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? And that's what yeah. I'm talking about when I say that. And so... I think the, the, the narrative that we've been driving on our planet is that it, it's, it has always been towards look at someone else to see yourself, you know, judge yourself by someone else's accomplishments yeah. to know yourself. And yep. I think that that has become a very, um, you know, when I think about rocks falling off of a, a cliff, you know, and then another one comes, another one comes, and then the whole thing falls. That's what that looks like. And that's yeah. not, that's not, I, I don't want, I don't want to live a landslide. You know, no one wants yeah. a landslide. Who wants a landslide? Yeah. It's crazy too, you know, in like the spirituality community, it's like, you know, we talk about the sovereignty and it's like the spirituality community can be almost the most distorted within the loss of sovereignty when you're in that in-between stage before you get to like actual true spirituality of like Taoism, Buddhism, love one stuff. So it's just so funny how it's like, it can be lost so much even in the community that thinks it doesn't lose it. 
Yeah. Well, I think the whole spiritual community is a bunch of malarkey, if you want, you want my honest opinion. <laughs> I think they're like bull schnot, you know, like really. Because like, I mean, and the, the spiritual community is the most judgmental community, yeah. more so than the ones who they think are the judgmental ones. Because in the spiritual community, it's not based upon you really acknowledging and holding that autonomy of, of inner independence. It's about like, if you're following the rules to look good and seem good and be health and wellness and like, and like be portray this kind of image of like, I like, I'm doing all these things. See my Instagram, I did a cold plunge today. And yesterday I did something with Wim Hof. And now I'm doing a shamanic retreat. And I just had a chia seed pudding. And oh my God, have you, did you guys go to the drum circle last night? I know I did, you know, and it's like, no, 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 no. That's why I say like wellness is realness. And spirituality is just a bridge to true, like really evolution. It's like, what is spirituality? And that whole community is fake. It's real, it's not real. Because if you have to like, if you have to like peacock your spirituality, right? Cause that whole peacocking thing. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I get it. Like people like to peacock. Okay, great, whatever, I get it. Like, it's, it's hilarious and, and, and loving and like, it's like, oh, you're so sweet, you're so cute. You know, it's like peacock yourself, right? You're peacock your spirituality, but it doesn't mean you're spiritual because spirituality is a bridge to evolution. It's not evolution, it's a bridge to evolution. And I think the key element here is to stop peacocking and, and start, you know, lit rocking. And what I call lit rocking is like, do it because you choose to do it, not because everyone is gonna like you doing it. Mm -hmm. And with the, the, I guess, tell me more about the bridge piece, you know, spirituality being the bridge to evolution. Yeah, because a lot of times we forget that evolution is real. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a known fact that things do evolve. And, and the spirituality is the key to helping you open up perceptions or doors of perception. So it doesn't matter if you're chanting with your Bohansen or you're strumming your mala beads or you're standing on a mountain looking at your ocean or you're doing a yoga class or doing breath work or you're sitting with your friends pulling out tarot cards and laughing and giving each other readings and reading the book or whatever it may be that you get into that everyone likes to get into these days to keep that coping mechanism on high, right? It's about realizing that everything you're doing is just for you to open up more doors of perception. And so the more doors of perception, the more you're actually able to see, oh my God, like I am not this like boxed human being that the world has said I am. I'm actually a consciousness that can take any shape, any form, any color, anything I want to do. And all I have to do is just accept that that's who I am today. Like I could be say, talking to you today and be like, Yes, girls, and the key to spirituality is for us to reference the point between separation and understanding the part of us that needs to come into wholeness. Or it could be like, you know what? It is so amazing, so rock and roll that we just learn how to like literally two-step ourselves into a whole nother dimension. Like I could be however I want to be. I could be soft, I can be mellow, I can be intense, I can be crazy, I could be little my little boy, I could be a little girly type, I could be anything I want. That's the cool thing about spirituality is that it's just a bridge to realizing evolution and evolution has no shape, no form. It's whatever you want to say it is. So like, you know, like who, who, who like, I love that movie, Call Me By, by Your Name. It's like, who yeah. are you today? Who, what is your name? Like, what do you call yourself? Yeah, I think like one of the pains of being a human is thinking that you have to be that one thing. Or that, you know what I mean? That you have to find that one thing or find that one purpose or find that one identity. And I just love that. I love that emphasis on just the dynamic of being so many things and existing in so many different dimensions and like loving all of those parts of you. What have been parts of you that you've really grown to love that you, that you once did not? Uh, I would, you know, I would say the part of me that I've grown to love, or should I say not grown to love, but more of accepted into my dynamic multidimensional um, structure of me would be uh, the ET aspect of myself. You know, um, the ET aspect, I would also say the female that took a while for me to get into. And I thank my dad for the opening on that one. Um, because it was only so much I could see women being abused before the female in me woke up and had an, and the queen was like, I've had enough. Mm. You touch my sister one more time and there will be hell to pay. Mm. And so, you know, I had, it, it was like the male in me was the, the, there, but the female in me was sleeping and she couldn't see, or I, the male wouldn't let her see yeah. 
the abuse upon her sister. And it was like only when I was willing to wake up the female in me to see what was being done to my sisters that I actually take rightful action and actually realize like this is this is a hard no for me. And, and I, I'm sorry, I don't care. I don't care if you're my best friend, the way you talk to your wife. I, I literally I, I, I will I will bitch slap you with a dollar bill if you keep talking to your wife like that. No, I'm not really going to bitch slap him with a dollar bill, but maybe I will. Who knows? I could be an interesting side of me. But the thing I'm saying is I'm not going to put up with it. You're not going to disrespect your wife or your girlfriend or any woman in front of me anymore because there's a woman in me who feels disrespected every time you disrespect a woman. And so that woman in me woke up and was always there, but was, was I wasn't letting her come through. And by letting her come through, it's even strengthened my relationship with my girlfriend because I have such respect for her because the woman in me has respect for her. And it's like, yes, sister, speak. Yes, yes. And so, you know, it it really, I think those two aspects, you know, really have become um, wonderful aspects for me of my multidimensional personality that I'm happy that have surfaced and they have been um, anchored and they are sustained. And now they are operating at full force through my being and rocking the Casbah. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> but yeah, the female part of you has been really beautiful to see, like you just fully integrate and embody. The ET part, do you, when you're talking about that, are you talking about like reptilian brain or like actual, like your ET DNA or like your ET brethren? Like, what are you talking about? So I'm, I'm, I'm half reptilian, or I would say half, about a percentage of, of I would say not half. What would you say, council members, in that half? like a third. And then the other is I'm Andromedian. I'm from Andromeda. Powerful. And so the ET, the reptilian part of me understands human structures and how to take them down because we're masters at building structure. And the, um, the Andromeda side knows how to bring people to see their highest truth, like to see who they are in their essence so that they are not being lost in the, in the fold or in the swamp of other people's personalities and emotions, right? So I'm really good at taking a person because of my Andromeda side with the knowledge of my shamanism and with the knowledge of my little boy and with the knowledge of the woman inside of me, being able to see a person and see all of the amazing gifts that they hold and then how do we preserve them so that they're not pushed away or silenced or repressed or oppressed because someone is uncomfortable with it or because society says it's not okay to say those things or that you get affected by someone because of it's all based on you being able to be what you were born to be and so as an andromeda we are a type of species that comes from andromedia and we we operate on the idea of beings being able to express as they choose without, uh, without any oppression or suppression. So I, I believe in true liberation and, um, and liberation, not just from the sense of like from labels, I'm talking full liberation. I'm talking like liberation to the point where you are not putting any type of rules or boxes or walls or barriers to freedom and joy and pleasure and ecstasy and bliss and whatever makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And for your, was it your count? Who told you about Andromeda or did you always know as a kid that that was your home galaxy or what was that like? Yeah. The voice that speaks to me inside Mm -hmm. that tells me that I'm integrated, an integrated uh, being that, you know, that all these different spirits, the things that I call my past lives really aren't my past lives, but they are my past lives because they <laughs> integrated together to create me, right? So did I really have a life in Egypt? No, but because everything is based on frequency, yes, I did. <laughs> but there's about 20,000 other people who are also all moon raw and we shared the same body as well. So they were also Amun Ra. And there's a thousand Cleopatras who lived as Cleopatras and there's a thousand, you know, you name it, all the different people that have lived throughout history. It's not just one soul per one body. It's not like a, you know, like a one box for one, you know, thing in it. It is like one box with 20 different small stones in it that each stone is a different soul that has lived in different dimensions and they create the new form, which is you and me and so forth and so on. Has your soul ever lived through something like we're living through now? So oh, yes. July yes. 2020 pandemic. Um, there is, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. There is so much going on. So I'm just wondering, yeah, do you have remembrance of another lifetime similar? Absolutely. Many. 
Absolutely, yes. Especially when I was an elder in Atlantis, I remember this as if it was yesterday. Just different buildings. Our buildings are a little bit more Neanderthal now. Our buildings were a lot more, um, you know, governed towards balancing, uh, connecting with nature and being a part of nature versus these buildings are toxic with all these weird materials that we're constantly breathing in and the structures, the square structures. We didn't have square structures in Atlantis. And, and it, yeah, Atlantis was such a powerful time too. You know, the use of crystals. I don't know if you remember that, but like the use of crystals. I remember everything. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Atlantis? Yes, Atlantis um, was a beautiful place. Uh, it was where you would say, what would you say today Atlantis would be a mixture of like they were the Caribbean and a lot of those, your, uh, uh, what is it called? Like, um, the Caribbean, the Bahamas, those places, all those places on the, that area. So Atlantis was a place where we believed very strongly in um, cooperation through intellect. Um, we didn't speak a lot, you know, we, uh, we used a lot of our intelligence through telepathic communication and symbolisms. So like you could walk in the, in the city of Atlantis and you would know there's like symbols on the wall and you would know where everything is because you knew how to read those symbols. And it would be like four symbols and each symbol had a huge amount of knowledge. And so we were very much into downloading information and frequencies. We're frequency masters. And Atlantis, we were really connected with nature and we would use sound and we would use um, like uh, reflections and prisms from crystals, uh, different types of prison, uh, prism structures. So like to give you an example is that we would have these three different um, enclaves and in each enclave we have like different crystals that would be on top that would create the sunlight when it would hit it it would reflect into this uh, this this kind of like um, a dome and then those who are going through difficult um, times with themselves like depression or sadness or anything they would sit into those domes for a certain amount of time very short amount of time because they worked very efficiently and um and they would be completely cleared of those things we had chambers where we created like a windmill type situation you know where you this we it would be this spinning that would go on from the water the ocean water would go into this tank that we built um we used wood and stones and when it would go in it would filter through this um opening that we created that would pour into this other vessel and that vessel would then allow this, this spinning to happen. And there would be these beautiful um, chambers of stone that were made of clay and stone with holes in them. And so people would lay in them and the ocean water would come in and the pressure would build through these, through these, um, these chambers and create these high pitch whistling sounds. And it would go through the holes of this, this, this clay chamber and onto the body. And so if the body was experiencing any pain or suffering or any kind of hurt or bruises or anything of that nature, it would actually heal the body by using pressure and sound. And so the body would actually heal itself and become stronger. And we also, in Atlantis, we had um, these, these, these uh, circular um, places where we would all sit in circular seats that were like, like imagine like a small circle, bigger circle, bigger, 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 bigger circle. And people would meet there and we would all make these sounds. And these sounds would create this energy. And above us was this beautiful circular thing with all of these um, tubes with crystals in them. And they would vibrate and they would ricochet off these reflective glasses. And they would make this sound through the whole entire Atlantis, like, this, like you were inside of a sound bowl, as to say. Mm -hmm. And we were very, our technology was very advanced. We, we understood the body in, as energy. We knew how to change the cells and the molecules of the body. I mean, there's so many things I can tell you about Atlantis that I remember. Um, very beautiful ways in which we, how we sourced our food, how we, how we conducted um, the city and the harmony. But the problem that took place in Atlantis was that there was a group of people who started utilizing their scientific um, abilities with, with, the, with these other ETs that had come to, to make themselves known with us. And they started learning their technology and they started utilizing their technology and experimenting on, on other Atlanteans. 
And they started taking, experimenting on Atlanteans, experimenting on animals, experimenting with the DNA, experimenting with the cells. And that caused the problem because then you started getting people wanting to create like men and horses cells come together and like different types of species merging their cells together to see if they can create a complete cluster. And those things took a lot of, of energy and a lot of power and that was causing a lot of destruction. So there was a big uh, upheaval against those who were the, the, the leaders who were operating in that ability. And then the ones who were wanting to keep Atlantean in their more pure state started to rise up against each other. And it got so much to the point where it became these wars that, that took over. And because of it, because of the sound ways that we, we didn't use missiles and bombs like we do today, we use sound as a weapon. And sound became a weapon. And when sound was at a certain frequency, it can hit you and like throw you across the room. And it was the way that the technology was given and it created such an obstruction that uh, the tidal waves, we've created a tsunami and the tsunami came and we knew it was coming because certain elders were having dreams and visions about it. And they were telling the people to stop. We have to stop. We have to find a way to, to come together. And people didn't want to come together. Everyone was on this side. Everyone was divided on this side. And there was this power structure that was keeping everyone in this state because they wanted to, they saw it as a way to gain power over the people. And these, um, and these other beings who are Palladians who, are, who could constantly visit us and help us, they were explaining to us that we are creating a, an atmosphere that was so violent to the earth that we were going to end up losing, we're, 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 we're going to be destroyed. So the ones who were the elders were a group of, of different people, a part of a, a, what we call a community cluster. They were elders in the community that handled different aspects of Atlantis from everything from the sea creatures to the healing stuff to the, the you know, making sure that all of the sourcing of seaweed and different things from the oceans was, was procured in a certain way so the Atlanteans could eat. And what happened was um, they were alerted to, to merge with the, to sit with the Palladians and, and the Palladians gave up three of their ships as an ark to make it so that they could, we could, we could take the cell of every living thing and, and, and put it into containers that they could hold and take a certain amount of people because we knew, they knew that we would be destroyed by the waters. And, um, and so they, they did that and Atlantean people drowned. It was, it was horrible. The waters were like ripped through the city and people drowned and there was no way for people to get out of the water because the whole thing went under. It cracked in the center and cracked all the way around the whole entire city. And you have to understand, Atlantean was on the water, but also went up into the mountains. And so all of that started cracking. So if you read the story of Noah's Ark in the Bible, this was Atlantis. Mm -hmm. This was the story of Atlantis, but it wasn't one man named Noah. It was a group of different elders in different pockets of communities. Think, it like, think of like when you have a tribe and you've got maybe 20 tribes, that, but they're all interacting with each other harmoniously. And then there's ones who are, who are learning. And the ones who were giving the technology that was causing these effects, those are the ones who wanted to keep us enslaved. They want us to enslave ourselves. So they were, they were manipulating, um, they were scientist type beings that we call greys to this day. And they were manipulating some of the Atlanteans to turn against their own people. And that's what they, and so they, and then other ETs have come along and they have been basically doing the same thing for, for a very long time and still are to this day. I didn't know greys were negatively oriented. They're scientists. So we don't look at it as negative. Yeah, right, right. So we have to understand in the spiritual context, Negativity is based upon your ide ideology right. of right and wrong, and right and wrong changes depending upon culture right. and history and observation of creation and upbringing and knowledge and storytelling. Right. So we, 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 we do not see things at that time as negative. They were scientists mm -hmm. and they were experimenters and they like to experiment on, on DNA and cells. And that's what they do. I'm sure, I'm sure the government is not likely to tell all this information. But yeah, that's what they do. 
And, um, and so that's what they were helping Atlanteans do. And not only Atlanteans, but Sumerians. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, it just got out of hand. And a lot of times people think it's the reptilians. And the reptilians are not the ones who enslaved us. The reptilians are the ones who helped us create a structure that we can actually start building upon. Um, their structure, all reptilians do is create structure and create structures that, that fold onto one another. So, but these scientists who don't feel pain and don't have emotions, they are the ones who believe um, in seeing every species as an experiment. So they're like car cargo traders. They, they go from one planet to the next planet, experimenting on the different beings and then sam taking their DNA and merging it with other species and then creating them and putting them on another planet and watching them develop and see what happens when they have these mixed DNA structures. And so they were responsible when they go back all the way back into the times of the Anunnaki and the Mu people. Mm -hmm. Lots there. Um, I, I, I would love to talk about that like divisiveness and the division and that power structure and just how we see that through throughout history mm -hmm. and not just recent history but thousands of years is there a purpose to that is is that just kind of a disease within the system how would you it's explain that yeah it's it's a mental disease because when i was a teacher on atlantis the ones who were operating with those beings and those scientists we're not thinking about the harmony that we Atlanteans created with nature. They were thinking about how they can be smart and intelligent and raise and be more, and, 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 and how do I say, I give themselves accolades off of their intelligence by showing that they created something new that no one ever saw before. Is that ego? The ego is not what people think the ego is. Think of the ego as the part that is here to anchor you to your reality. So the ego's job is just to take whatever you believe and make it real for you. So the ego doesn't live in duality. It is operating in what do you believe? What do you say you are? What do you believe that to look like? What is your perception on that? And then the ego takes it on. So let's say, for instance, you're, you believe that the world is a loving place and love is all around you. And that's truly what you believe. Then your ego will create a narrative to make sure that you get that experience in your life because that's what you believe. Well, let's say you're an insecure person and you're so insecure, then your ego takes on the protector mode and then it protects you from anyone hurting you. And so what the ego does is it battles anyone that looks like a threat to the hurt part of the being that is not able to stand on its own. That's why when people say, oh my God, you're so in your ego, it's not that the person is in their ego, it's that they're in their insecurity and the ego is outwardly saying, no, whatever you say to me, I'm gonna battle you. And whatever you say, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull proofs, I'm gonna pull information, I'm just gonna argue with you, I'm gonna do whatever I have to do. If I have to step on you or push you down, whatever it takes to protect this, this hurt person inside that you don't see I'm protecting, that's what I'm going to do because that's the narrative they want me to write for them. Yeah, I like the hurt person inside. I think that's a really good one. The ego being a protector of that, that's really powerful. Um, when you, and about the reptilians too, I wanted to clear that up, you know, because I think the perception if you're in the, the ET community is that the reptilians are, you know, the overlords of, of all the darkness that exists on. As I roll my planet. eyes with I laughter. So, so I would love to just hear more about about that? Well, you know, human beings are a very interesting species, you know, and I find ever since I've been in the human body, since the first time I came here, I have found it to be very interesting in the, in the way that human beings structure identity and how they operate in the field of what they see as bad or good yeah. or what they think an overlord actually is. Yeah. You know, we could even say that we are overlords into animals and yet human beings would not choose to accept that because it would make them look like they're in a bad light, but they can put something else in a bad light and say that it's an overlord of them without having any facts or proof to, to, to justify it, but just mm -hmm. say it because it sounds better to say that they are actually a victim than yeah, actually victim. being the victor. Right. So if we understand human development, we understand that human beings, there was a time when human beings were in harmony with nature, communicated with the trees and the animals and the nature, and they had such a different respect for them that they do now. 
but because of the industrial age and because of the need to use the mind and see the accolades of the self, that feeling that you get when you do something great and you tell yourself something wonderful about yourself because the world was depleted of love and the world was depleted of love and the sensitivity of acknowledgement or self-acknowledgement, should I say, because of the oppression of women. So when you oppress women, you create what we call a cutoff of the feminine energy moving through your body, which creates what we call um, imbalanced equilibrium. You're operating in a masculine cortex aspect of your being, which is held in the idea of structure and building, which we know that the reptilians made it very clear to us that if we ever separate ourselves from the feminine nature, that we would become destructors. And that true structure is built in synergy, not in discordance. That is the reptilians whole teaching to us in ancient times. But human beings want to turn them bad because of course they, um, they operate in structure. And we think that the structure that they taught us is the one that we've been using. And so we think that that structure is bad because it's holding us in some kind of like uh, enslavement. But the enslavement came because the reptilians were very clear. If you separate the frequency, can you hear me? Yeah. No. If you separate the frequency out of synergy into duality, chaos will come. Yeah. Suffering will come. Death will come. And so the moment we cut off the feminine energy, which means we separated it from its synergy and made the masculine and feminine indifferent in, in to each other, we then created the, the part of what you see in the patriotic system and the structures that are built, not as an all-inclusive, invite everything in, including nature and animal, of, of all of us coexisting as a species upon species on a beautiful planet called Gaia. No, we instead begin to operate in the idea of fear over that which we can't understand because the feminine nature in synergy allows us to understand the in and the out as a whole, not as a separate. And so therefore we started to destroy, destruct, deconstruct, and we carded more. You have, if you ever watch a child start taking something apart, that's because they're operating outside of their feminine energy. I talk about it in the spirit hacking book. I give us a great analogy of it when I talk about the butterfly and how the difference is, is that a boy who's operating more on his masculine will rip the wings off the butterfly Whereas a girl will say, oh my God, look at its beauty, look at its intricateness, look how delicate it is, what a beautiful thing it is. Because she's operating still in the feminine. The feminine is about nurture, expand, create, and, 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 and hold, protect, uh, conserve, preserve. And the masculine is about structure and definition and exactness and, um, and, and how do we say uh, uh, movement of that structure and also understanding of the parts of that structure. So if the feminine is not there to hold where it's synergized, it's not one or the other, it's a synergy. And that's what the reptilians represent is synergy. They taught us synergy and we took apart the synergy and separated and that's when we had our downfall. That's when we were able to be um, easily manipulated by other species. And that is when we started taking ourselves down. That's when we started oppressing women, women who were wise and sitting on powerful thrones and helping guide kingdoms and helping bring wisdom and bringing knowledge to the villages and being the healers with the herbs and knew what thing to take from the earth and how to keep balance. We're getting murdered and killed and ridiculed and raped and pillaged because people were afraid of them and started coining them as witches and sorcerers and evil and you know all these things. I mean, I could I, I could go back and, and show you if we look at the history books, you will see that the same recourse of the human nature to keep giving itself mental accolades to feel loved and important has been the destruction of humanity and not just humanity of animals and not just animals but nature and not just nature but the structure of the way we think individually and collectively. And that is why it is so important to bring the two into synergy again, so that we can erect the four pillars of reality, the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, earth, fire, water, and air, 
and be able to step into fifth dimensional elemental experience. Yeah, isn't that it? Yeah, the synergy of masculine and feminine, I think, um, why, why are people so averse or afraid of that? I love your questions, they're so wonderful. The reason why they're afraid of it is because there is a program system put in place that keeps people in what I call the perpetual groundhog's day. It needs people to stay in cycles and it needs people to follow rules and it needs to have clauses that go onto those rules so that you keep following them. The idea that you're gonna to go to hell or something bad's gonna happen or you're gonna end up broke or no one's gonna to wanna to hire you. Everyone's gonna laugh at you. Everyone's gonna think you're crazy. Well, I mean, again, we live in a world where the vacuous hole that we've created out of our own depravity has come from, the, to not, from disrespecting women and not honoring their wisdom and their teachings to merge us back to each other, has created what we call this, this gap, this chasm, this void, where we think we are not loved unless, we think we are not valued unless, we think we are not someone unless. And so the idea of love's foundation is shattered so when love is not, uh, the foundation of love is no longer existent, then you begin to operate against yourself for the need to retrieve that which is missing, that you think is missing, but that's the illusion. It's the vacuous chasm that you think is there that is the endless void of emptiness. Because so you think you have to fill it up in order to feel safe in order to be loved, in order to have value, in order to be seen, in order to be heard, in order to matter. And that recourse is what the system uses to keep us in this space of accepting the responsibility of upholding those false clauses of something bad is going to happen to you unless you do this. And so the this, no one knows what the heck that is. No one knows what's going to happen to them. No one knows, but they just think it is because it's been pushed by so many people to hold that clause. If you've got, if you're born into a family, okay, let's just, let's just take this for a second. A child is born into a family and three members of that family, and there's two members of that family, and three members of that family hold a clause that if you don't do this and you don't do that, you're not going to get to heaven. God's going to send you to a fiery pit of hell and all these things. Let's just use a religious way of looking at it, okay? Two of those people in the family say, we love you, just be who you want to be, okay? The fact that there are three people holding a clause, which is three authorities over two, the child will generally go to the three and obey the three because the three are the called, it's called the dominated force by numbers. Now, this is something interesting. I really want you to hear this, okay? Because this is a very key element to why the system does what it does. There is an old saying that says, when one or more are gathered, there are power. Well, it's true because each person holds in them a powerful source called resource and intellect and emotional frequency that is so strong that one person, if they choose, can change the world if they have a strong enough magnetic charge in their body. Now, there's two things that create magnetic charges, joy and fear. These two energies are strong polarities. Now, let's say, for instance, you have three in the family versus two. That's three authority energies telling you about this thing that's going to happen where there's two who aren't, but because they're gathered in three and there's only two and the two um, are not in three, the three always is the one that will magnetically pull because there's more magnetic energy pulling that child. This is why the system needs to make sure we never come together. Because if we come together, then we come together collectively as a magnetic force. And that magnetic force, just by one thought alone, is strong enough to take the whole thing apart. So what do they have to do? And if you read the Towers of Babel, you actually find 
um, in the in the story of, of of the Towers of Babel, which is actually a very really um, strong point, okay, to uh, be able to to tap into. So we talk about the Towers of Babel. I just want to pull it up because I really want you to hear um, this this um, effort from the the Bible, okay. So. Uh, we want to go into um, Powers of Babel story. Okay, here we go. All right. So it's in the book of Genesis. Okay, and it talks about, hear me again, God observing the city and the tower confounded the, by the people who gathered together as one to erect a tower to be as a God. And it says, Look at them building a tower to be like us. Let us go down there and confuse them by shifting their language and send them scattering around the world. Now, this is in the Bible. This is in the book of Genesis. It's called the Towers of Babel. Okay. Now, if we understand this, has, this is, if you look at the tarot card, uh, if you look at the tarot card, oops, if you look at the tarot card, the tower, this is an example of the Towers of Babel. It is the idea that if you think you're so big and mighty and you come together as a collective, you're too powerful for whoever's speaking in, that, in the Towers of Babel, which is really, truly not God, because God would want us to come together. Right, that's it kind is, of odd to me. Isn't that odd? That's very odd. Right. And so... Let us go down there and confuse their language. Now, why would a God of love right. that is all about, love is about, uh, is a magnetic energy that pulls in and connects. Why would a God of love want to confuse everyone when they're coming together as a whole? It wouldn't. Right. But a species that sees that if we are gathered in numbers, our magnetic charge is so strong that nothing can affect us, stop us, or limit us, says, look at that. They'll become like us, a collective, a true collective. So let us go down and confuse them by scrambling their brains and where they can't understand each other anymore mm -hmm. and then send them scattering. That is what the system wants more than anything. Yep. Keep us divided mm -hmm. keep us in scattering keep us away from one another you think the system wants white and black culture to come together <laughs> do you know what type of power happens when a white person and a black person comes together in love do your ancestry, if you're white, look through your ancestry. And if you're black, look through your ancestry. And instead of looking at the horror and the suffering and the whatever, look at the wisdom that each of your ancestries hold and then bring them together with another person that is different and merge them and watch how powerful you'll be. Mm. They know. You think they want women and men to find equilibrium and synergy? Ha! Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Do you can, know what that will do to the system? I cannot believe that's in the Bible. I'm kind of every, you know, the Bible's a beautiful text, but you Absolutely. Know, there's, there's there's parts where it's like it the distortion is so obvious, it's kind of perplexing to me because the God that we believe the God is to be would come down from the tower and be amongst the people rather than be in a tower in the first place. So and it's interesting what you said too about the language thing. And I think we're realizing that now today is like the weaponization of language to really keep people quiet. And so I'd love to talk about, you know, that. Well, think about it. If we go back and look at, right, because when we look at the Bible, we're looking at Old Testament and New Testament, right? So there's the Old Testament of the angry God, the New Testament of Jesus and his, uh, his love for the people, his healing, his devotion, mm -hmm. his willing to take abuse from us and still love us even in his dying days while we're still abusing him for things that we're scared of, of the unknown, right? Which is what we do to each other all the time anyway, right? And the whole idea of Jesus dying for our sins is not that he's dying for our sins, he's the sin 
is the ignorance against love. So when people think sin, they think, oh, he, you're, you're, you're sinful. No, no, no. Sinful means ignorant against love. It means anything that is oppressive against love is a sin. So dying for our sins is the ignorance against the almighty love that is present and seen and felt when one is willing to feel and see the presence of God that is everywhere in everything, all around us, all the time, every time, that love, that permeating love that never ceases, never goes away, and never leaves us for any reason, that love. Every time we speak against ourselves, we speak against that love. Every time we put down another person and laugh at them, we're putting down that love. We're going against that love. Every time we think we should eat before another person and they should starve and we should eat, we're going against that love. Every time we do anything that is against that love, we're going against that love. That is the sin. So when we talk about, when we talk about the ultimate sin is literally you falling from grace, which means you falling from the awareness of love's continuation that is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipotent. It is always present. It never goes away. You are the only one that makes it go away by the way you think. And this is what Jesus was sharing with the people, but he had to explain it to them in the way of the land and seeds and, and mustard seeds and, and, and wheat chaffs because he was talking to farmers. He was talking to people of the land and the earth. So he had to explain it in that way. We have come very close to that awakening of the Christ in all of us. Christ consciousness. Yes. You see it every time you love for the sake of love. Not because someone's doing something for you. Not because someone owes you something. Not because it makes you look good or makes you be this amazing person. No, no, no. It's because that's just who you are. That's Christ consciousness. Right? That is the second coming of Christ. That is, the, oh, that is Christ in embodiment. So, but the aspects of humanity, Christ is already here. It's already here. It's saying, let me into your vessel. Let me be a part of your, 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 of everything you do, your job, your relationship, your interactions with people, the way in which you do everything. Let me be a part of that. And people give half and half. They're like, okay, I'll let you be a part of it with my family. But when it comes to a stranger, uh-uh, Christ is out the door. And I'm back to being mm -hmm. that, that disenfranchised human being that still hasn't brought in the synergy of the masculine and the feminine. The Christ is the synergy. With everything that's going on in the world right now, especially this year, are you hopeful that there will be, will be that integration and that synergy be in the wake of all of this suffering and destruction? I, I don't see the wake of suffering and destruction. So the better way for me to answer the question is what I see is the wake of that which we have forgotten to love free. You see, suffering is because of discomfort from the comforts that you have been given that you think is your safety and your security. So anything that is opposition of that sensation or feeling, you see it as a form of suffering. I do not. You see, I see, I see greatness taking place right now. The fact that human beings can actually let themselves be angry and be able to see it. The fact that, that women are able to see the, the depravity of the nature that they have felt towards someone else that they believed was their oppressor when they, it was them all along is quite a remarkable thing to see of us realizing that you don't shift into a new paradigm unless you can embrace and transmutate 
transfigurate and transform the energy that was. You don't just get off and leave it behind for, for the next generation. That was what our ancestors did. That's why we are going through what we're going through. We are cleaning up the energies that we have not showed up for love to. We are making available the things we thought did not exist. We are acknowledging the things in life that we have turned a blind eye to. And now we are really beginning to understand what it means to be a true being of light. Jesus didn't come here with roses and flowers. La, da, de, da, de, da, de, da, da, da. No. Jesus didn't walk in. Everyone was like, we love you, Jesus. We love you. Uh -uh. Jesus came in and people were like, you blasphemous traitor. You this, you're going to get yours. How dare you? You should be burned on the pillars and da 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 and ba 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 how do you think we come to this planet for a vacation? This is not, this is not Turks and Caicos. This is not a vacation for the soul. This is not where we go in the universe for vacation. <laughs> we don't go to earth for vacation. We go to earth <laughs> to nudge people with love. We go to be a, a, what we call um, um, an interruptus in the frequency that we that is happening we are a gentle reminder that there's something more behind that which people see we have come here to be uh, a, a person who's here to to just interrupt the current so each of us add a little interruptus into it and then we go home and then it grows and builds and builds and the song changes and all of a sudden that very intense song that was like boom 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 all of a sudden becomes this wonderful this very beautiful orgasmic melody that is sung throughout the universe and the earth itself begins to sing because we came in to interrupt the current and we don't do it through force we don't do it through yelling and cursing at people and going off because that's what they want us to do it keeps us divided we do it the way christ did it through love through kindness, the way Buddha did it, through love and kindness, generosity, engagement. I see you're upset. I see that there's things happening. How can I show up for you? You already know the storm is here. We're not here to stop the storm. We're here to let the storm rip everything apart so we can know what to give love to and then rebuild the new kingdom of the fifth dimension that is already here. And we, the blueprint's already here. We just need to add our light source to it to erect it. And that's, the, and that's it. Even the podcast that, that you have created is, 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 is not what people think it is used for. They think you're just talking about a bunch of different things and sharing, bringing on guests and stuff. That's the illusion. That's the, the physical thing that human beings need to experience. There is code writing going on in your podcast that is opening up doorways inside of them that they may not even know that is there just by listening. These are the things we put our mind to at this time. Not this, this, uh, masquerade ball of people finally figuring out what's been hiding underneath the carpet. Well, get a vacuum, I say. You know, get a broom. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, the sh I love the way you're showing up. It's, it's fucking everything. You guys on the video, you will see. I mean, lean back, taking, taking a breath, watching what is happening with our collective ascension and just enjoying the damn show. I want to ask as my last question, we Powerful. talked about it on our live, but um, in spirit hacking, you, you gave people a pretty good insight into what, what's going on in 2020 and beyond. I would love just like to kind of give people tips for how to just, how to, how to prepare or what you see for the future. I think the greatest way that you can prepare, and I will say this, 
without putting too much emphasis upon it. Learn to be a, you know, this is interesting. This is an interesting thing. And I, you know, I, I find it to be very, um, very poignant to what I'm about to explain to you. You know, there, there was, um, you know, we've gone through the whole Hitler and the Nazi war and everything. And there are times where soldiers would come through the different villages that were in shambles with tanks and everything. And then they would notice that the kids were still playing. And they still were playing and they're still having fun, even though there was this crazy war happening around them. And why do I say that? Well, I say it because of this. The key element is, is for you to see the situations that are taking place. Yeah, you can see them. However, you still must be that child who's willing to dance in the midst of chaos. Color and paint and smile and create and be innovative and, you know, and, and find more ways to bring more joy, more laughter, more pleasure, more bliss into your lives, even when there are, is chaotic things happening around you. So that you become the child that when they roll through town and they see the buildings in shambles and the tanks and, you know, all the loss and people who've left and died and moved on, which is you don't really die. You actually just move on because you're an eternal being. You're that child that they see that is what we call the spark of knowing that we shall continue. We shall go. We, we, we will live on. You are that child who's still being able to create amongst the chaos. And if you can remember that, whatever shows up, you're going to be fine. Beautiful. Oh, man. Love it. I'm very grateful. Yeah. Um, love hanging with you. My last question. Um, you're in love. I love hanging with you, too. I love, I love hanging with you. You're in love your girlfriend and yeah. you are just symbols of of not only love but light and unity and I know uh I know your story but I would love for you to share just why why your relationship is so important to you mm. as an individual and then also because you you both are public figures why it feels important to the collective so I would say to you that um, for me, I've been through a lot of relationships, men, women, I've been through them all. I'm very, uh, I call myself a soul sexual person. Um, and with all the different people that I've been through, you always, when you're in a relationship, you always want to come home to a person where you can say anything, do anything, and you're loved unconditionally. And I used to look for that in those other relationships and it wasn't there. And I, and I realized that it wasn't there because I wasn't feeling comfortable being transparent. I was holding on to things that I felt guilty that they would judge me or not liking me or something they would see or find out and that would probably be the end for them. But it was really my own judgments and my own end for myself. It was me not being transparent with myself. And it was when I realized that I only have this chance to show up and be transparent in my relationships was the moment Princess Marta walked into my life. And she said to me something really interesting and I laughed one day. She said, I had to find myself in order to find you. And I said, babe, you couldn't have summed it up so beautifully because there's nothing more graceful and more gentle and more loving and more nurturing than knowing that you don't have to hide anything from the person you love. That you can talk about anything. You can scream, you can yell, you can get all crazy and they still love you because they know that whatever you're going through is not about them, it's just your own triggers. And what, what I love about my relationship with her is that if I feel like I need to cry, she's arms ready to take me and vice versa. She can say to me, I need to scream and yell right now because I'm so angry right now at you. And I'm not like, oh, really? About what? Which is what I used to do and get defensive. I'm like, please share with me everything. And then she could just say whatever she wants to say. And I just hold that space for her. Because I know it's, it's not about that. 
or me, it's about something greater that we're all navigating together. So whatever her wounds are, whatever her pains are, are also my pains and my wounds. And so by me holding space for her to see her pains and her wounds, ah, oh, by the graces of God, it allows me to see my own. That's the disadvantage that we have when people don't choose to be transparent in relationships is that you really can't get the best you to merge because you're not giving the best uh, opportunity for both of you to emerge because you're choosing to hold things back. Powerful. And so where your second question is, you have two questions there. And so I want to answer to the second one being a part of the Royal family that comes along with the relationship doesn't really to me, it hinders our relationship only to the point where we let it hinder our relationship. And it's a graceful conversation, always talking about where we want to allow that to hinder us and where we should let it hinder us. And it shouldn't be a hindrance because of the fact that she was born Her Royal Highness Princess of Norway. And there is a, um, a grace to be had of choosing that as I have chosen to be Shaman Durek. The, the grace is knowing that as she rises and she continues to expand herself more and more to her, what we call um, true liberation, she's able to liberate the people of her country, those who are ready to receive it and those who are capable of allowing it. When we get into that awareness, it makes it easy us, easier for both of us to be able to handle the arrows and, and the words and the comments and, and the press and the paparazzi and all the things that come along with it. Because we understand that we're doing it not for us, we're doing it for the people. So when I am able to restrain myself from losing it, when I've lost it many times on, on television and as well as in interviews, when I think one interview on CNN, I cried. Um, you know, when I learned, oh, that's what made me triggered. Oh, that's what made me cry. Oh, that's what made me get mad at the press when they did that. Now, let me look at it in a different way. And let me see that this is not about the press. This is not about the royal family. This is about how do I show up every day for the people? I'm the people's shaman. She's the people's princess. She's not just the princess of Norway. She's the princess who's on the spiritual level that we both are representing in the world. The first monarchy to talk and share about health and wellness and spirituality and, and, and the first princess in all of the royal houses of her cousins from England to Luxembourg to you name it, all her cousins and one huge big family to speak upon racism, to speak upon white privilege as a princess, to date and be in love with a man of color who is a shaman. If this doesn't get much Disney to you, I don't know what does. You know, and, and, the, and at the end of the day, every time me and her have a conversation, it's never just about us. It's about the people, the people. How can we best show up for ourselves so we can show up for the people? How best can we look at our triggers so we can show up for the people? And so it's this beautiful, loving relationship that we have with the community and with ourselves. And our relationship is enveloped within it. So happy for you. So happy. Truly. Thank you. So happy. Wow. And just that piece about being yourself within relationship. It is so simple and like the mm. most powerful healing experience, I think. Like to be able to be witnessed by another in all of you, like all parts of you, the healed, the unhealed. It's just really, it's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. I can't wait for people to see video because, like, I just am like eating you up. <laughs> eating you fucking You're up. The best. You're the best. Oh, you know, I'm just a reflection of you and your reflection of me. And I love you, ladies, so much. So much. You know, I remember the first time I met you and I was like, those are my girls. Girls. Those are my girls. <laughs> we were, and you have been so helpful for us, you know, through Truly. the years. It's like, it's crazy. I've always said it. Like, you really like help people. Like anytime I've ever needed you, you're like, yep, there right away. Like you've never, never skipped a beat. And yeah, I just am so glad. So if you guys haven't listened, the first episode we did, iconic. I mean, honestly, we need to make merch. <laughs> Queens don't argue is like what Queens I hear. Queens don't argue, Queens baby. Queens don't argue. I honestly hear that regularly. It's like the quote of the century. <laughs> so make sure to listen to that one. Um, and then, yeah, where can our lovely community connect with you if they haven't already? 
you know, you can come into the healing temples on Fridays. I charge $10 for 30 minute healing. Uh, the healing is intense. It, it, can, it can vary between you, like you're on an ayahuasca ceremony or you just went on a big acid trip. And some people, it, you know, it's, uh, it's life transforming for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And that's Friday. And also we have the Ancient Wisdom Today podcast, shamandurek.com if you want to up level your powers in learning about yourself and your the invisible planes and the physical planes and how you can truly really master these energy fields to 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 be an, uh, a beautiful orchestration of of your intelligence and wisdom into manifestation on the earth we have the shaman school and it's great so and instagram of course as a, the new york times just did a thing saying i'm the shaman of instagram i thought that was quite interesting very matrixy but i'm grateful <laughs> hey, the Matrix it. is gonna feed my ego. I'm fucking in. Whatever. You know, that's what that's that's you know that's what Tanya said. And, you know, and it was really funny because when they walk, they followed me around for like a month, early February. It's coming out, and it came out now. And it's really funny because I remember thinking back. One day, I'm gonna be in the New York Times and cross over to the mainstream, yeah. even bigger. And it's it's here, and it's interesting how. It, it was never about me hustling to get there. It was always about me just like, you know, there's something that my friend Gwyneth Paltrow said to me that changed my life. Uh, she's, and she's such a, a wonderful instrument mentor for me in my life. And she said to me, it doesn't matter what people say, never read anything about yourself ever. Keep your eye on the tiger. Focus what you're doing and everything will come to you. She's like, you don't need to push. You don't need to fight. You don't need to do anything. It will all come to you, brother. You know, and she said that to me and I follow that. And it has helped me so much. And, you know, and I I love having people in my life who give me those beautiful seeds that I can plant in my consciousness and grow beautiful trees and flowers and, and just beautiful succulents and you know, I just, I just love it. It's just like, mm. and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so great. And I think we, we need to realize that our words are seeds and we are, every time we, we speak, we're yep. planting a seed into consciousness. We're planting a seed into someone's emotion. We're planting a seed into the earth. And we, we want to, what we want, we want a harvest that is, is, is delicious and wonderful and supports everyone. So I always say just the words alone, is important and just where you put your mind because every time you put your mind in something you're pulling those in and those are seeds that you're taking in to yourself as well so what type of things like someone writes something bad about you that's like you know just don't put your mind to it because that's a seed that they're trying to plant in you that's going to grow some kind of weird like i don't know some kind of morphed like I don't know, weed, that, I don't know, that one maybe hasn't even been created. But the point I'm making is, is that it, you don't want weeds in, in your beautiful conscious energy, right? You want beautiful flowers that smell succulent and honeysuckle and yumminess and mm, right? And that's what you want, right? And that, those are the things. So when you watch TV, say, okay, these are seeds going in me. Yeah. When I hear, hear so that's why I love country music, because I love country music, those are seeds that fill me up. When I see country music that is like degrading to women, I'm like, oh, I don't want those seeds in me, yeah. you know? And yeah. so, you know, and, and so like every time, every week, I'll sometimes send a country music song to my girlfriend and be like, oh, you got to listen to this country song. It's amazing, you know? And then she's finally started getting in the country and like, and she's like, wow, I see why you like it because it's like, it's home, it's home. It's like, it's real. It's like, I'm, I'm on the porch, I'm with my dog, I'm sitting down and looking <laughs> Done. Life don't get better than this. Dun, 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 dun. Yesterday I went to the barn and hold myself down all night, y'all. Life doesn't get better than this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I how? Can... Get better than this. Yeah, you know, sometimes the the greatness of life, like even when Zach Brown band sings, he's like, I'm just gonna pull up my chair and let the water hit the back of my chair, and I'm gonna have my beer. And I'm just gonna look out at the water, and that like like that's life, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like that's the moment the of life. Here. Yeah, I'm not, life, baby. Not being on some red carpet when everyone's like splashing things in your face. I'm like, oh no, I'd rather be on a horse with my girlfriend, riding with the kids, having our summer rides, you know, walking and being in nature, being on the earth, you know, just sitting back and sitting on a porch with some friends and listening to some good country music and everyone's just playing cards and having a good time. That to me, 
that is what life is, you know? Yeah. That's how I know I made it. I know yeah. I made it when I have those experiences. And that yeah. freedom. 100%. Yeah. Do that. Oof. You yes. know? Life doesn't get much better than this. Life, life doesn't, doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> life doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out with my two girls in the yeah. podcast. Life doesn't get better than this. Better than this. <laughs> Dude, this is what I needed. I know you're tempting me. Now you're making me want to go literally to, to the beach right away. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, love we you. love you so much, Derek. Thank I you. I love you too. Thank I love you, you too. I can't even just say, later. like, the words love doesn't even describe it. So I'll just say Amala Ashe. Amala I'm going to come to Healing Temple on Friday too. Yep. Done. Yay. Next Friday. Get ready. Let's do it. I want you to blast me away. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. We love you. I, I love, love you too. too. Mwah. Mwah.